Good morning, everyone. Just a few announcements to begin. First of all, we thank you to all who helped and supported the Holy Bible Club uh, through the week. We had a very successful week. There were lots and lots of children about, uh, so thank you for that. Uh, coming in September, uh, in preparation for our mission in November, we'll be running uh, the Six Steps to Talking About Jesus course. Um, that will be over three Tuesday evenings in September. If, uh, part of the preparation for that is we need to deliver a lot of material out around the doors. And so it's for those who will be doing that uh, to help them if they're asked questions to how to respond uh, in, in uh, an easy way. So please do think about that if you'd like to be part of that team. We'll be going out in October, uh, later on in October, to deliver material around, around the doors uh, in the area. This evening we meet in Middle Church uh, for our last of our epilogue services. That starts at 7pm and then uh, on advance notice Tuesday the 27th of August we'll meet at 7.45 in the hall for prayer. Uh, so advance notice of that prayer meeting on Tuesday the 27th. Joan's going to come up and she's going to uh, give us a further uh, announcement. Good morning again everybody. I sat a little bit higher up the church this morning because last Sunday I walked up from the back and by the time I got here I hadn't a puff, I could hardly speak. But just to remind you again about European Heritage Day which this year will be Saturday the 14th of September. Now um, we have in past years, uh, for some years not past, um, opened the Middle Church to visitors and we're always surprised at how much interest there is in the Middle Church. We take it for granted because it's been with us forever really. Um, so, if any, I'm looking for helpers. Can I thank everybody who came forward last week? If you have done European Heritage before, you'll know it's not too arduous. You're not a historian, you're just a meter and greeter. And as I said last week, if you can say good morning or good afternoon and welcome to Ballandera, that's all you need to do. We will have little leaflets to give out. You'll get one of those prior to um, the weekend so that you'll know what's in them and you'll have learned a little bit yourself, should anybody ask you a question. But as I say, we're not historians. Um, so if you've done it before, I hope you enjoyed it. If you're coming forward for the first time, well, isn't it nice to do something new? So I could do with a couple more helpers or a few more helpers. So I'll be in the hall again at the end of the service. And if you'd like to be involved, please come and see me. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Let's stand to sing our opening hymn for this morning, number 20 in the hymnal. Uh, the King of Love, my shepherd is. Let's stand.
Please turn in your prayer book to page 101. Please be seated. Beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. Let's take a moment to be quiet before the Lord and to examine our hearts and our lives. We join together in the confession on page 102, saying together, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our reading for this morning is from Matthew chapter 9 beginning at verse 1 through to 8 and then verse 18 through to 26. Matthew chapter 9. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, then he said to this paralytic, get up, take your mat and go home. And the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and they praised God who had given such authority to men. And then verse 18. While he was saying this, a ruler came and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died. But come, put your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter. Your faith has healed you. The woman was healed from that time from, from, from that moment. When Jesus entered the ruler's house, he saw the flute players and the noisy crowd, and he said, "Go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep." But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. News of this spread. Through, the, through all that region. Here ends our reading. We're going to stand to sing again, uh, number 222 in the hymnal, Here is Love.
As we remain standing, we profess our faith in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which will be on screen and are also on page 112 uh, in the prayer book. I believe in God. The Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, as we think of your word, we thank you, Lord, for the promises of your word. We thank you, Lord, for the promises that have been fulfilled in Jesus and the promises that through Jesus will be fulfilled to us in faith. Thank you, Lord, that in your love and in your grace and your mercy, you sent Jesus to be our saviour, to die on a cross for our sin and to rise on the third day. In all of this, we know forgiveness through faith. In all of this, we know hope, hope that will never perish, spoil or fade. And in all of this, we know the peace that you alone can give in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, help us to walk with you, trusting in your word, looking to Jesus, and being all that we are meant to be as believers in Jesus speaking of him, showing our lives to others through the transformation that has taken place because of him. Help us, Lord, to be faithful in all that we do. Father, we also pray for a world that knows no peace, a world that rejects you and dishonors you, a world that has fallen because of sin. In such a world, there is no peace, and war is a reality. Suffering is a reality. And so we pray for those areas of the world where there is war and where there is suffering, where there are natural disasters, where there is famine, where there is lack of water and crops. Father God, you are the sovereign God over the world. We pray for those areas where there is conflict that you may bring your peace to bear. That solutions would be found and war would stop. We pray particularly at this time for Ukraine and for Israel and Gaza and the Middle East in general. We pray for the people of Ethiopia where crops have failed again in Tigray. And we pray, Lord, that you would relieve their suffering. Awaken the government to the suffering of their people. Father, that's only the tip of the iceberg and we know it. There are so many parts of the world where these things are happening. We may not know it, but you do. So Father, we pray that you would intervene in our world and through your people, allow the hope of your gospel to be known. And so we pray for mission in our world. We continue to remember Gerald and Louise Mwangi and their family in Kenya. And we give you thanks for the work that has been done there to raise up those who would proclaim the gospel, both now and into the future. We pray for the training that's taking place in August. And we pray, Lord, that you would guide and direct Gerald and Louise in that and the team around them. Father, we pray for, as we've been praying for Tigray, we pray for the work of ORE. And we remember, Lord, that uh, through them, there are many families who are touched. There are many children who are helped. And we pray that that would continue. We pray that you would give the resources for that work to be done. But as we think of our world, we also remember our home. And we pray for our parish mission in the August, in the autumn rather. And we pray, Lord, just for the planning that needs to be done, for the preparation that needs to be made. And we pray for ourselves that we would indeed be a praying people, bringing this mission to you. 
Lord, you're the one who can transform lives. We can't. We can only be faithful in telling your gospel. So we pray, Lord, that you would prepare the ground. Prepare the ground of hearts and lives for that week in November. Prepare us to be at work beforehand. Show us the way we should be going. Open the doors to us, Lord, we pray, and draw people in under the gospel. Lord, in these things, may you have all the honour and all the glory, and may your kingdom be extended. In a moment's silence, we bring before the Lord those who are known to us to be in need of his help today, in trust that he, he can indeed help them, that he is able to help them and willing to help them. We name them before him. Lay your hand upon them, Lord, we pray. And if it be your will, restore them to health. That they may praise you for your goodness and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. And finally, let us sum up our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Send together our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and sing again. A praise to the holiest in the heights. Number 108.
Father, as we come to your word, speak into our hearts and our lives, Lord, I pray, and give us that understanding that comes from your spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> as we continue to think about Matthew's gospel this morning, we're reaching one of those crucial points of the gospel, uh, the need to recognize the Messiah, to acknowledge him and all that he was able to do for people then and is still able to do today. When you think about your life, the obvious thing to say is that there are people you come across in life for whom you naturally recognize their authority in any given situation. The police um, who uphold the law, the judiciary who enforce the law for those who have broken it, our doctors and our teachers who are equally people that we respect and listen to because we recognize their authority either in the classroom as children or when we're ill and need medical help. Recognizing these people's authority means that we listen to them, that we do what they say, and our lives work better. In the same way, when you see Jesus, in the Bible there were those who listened to and heard and saw what Jesus was doing and saying. Some of them believed him and followed him, whilst others dismissed him and rejected him. And for both groups, it was a matter of his authority. Some believed who he was and therefore submitted themselves and their lives to his authority. Others preferred to choose a different path and therefore turned away from what God was doing in their midst. So they could never accept Jesus as the Messiah sent by God as had been promised through his word. For people who remain in that situation, who deny the authority of Jesus over their lives, both then and now, we miss out. We miss out on the hope and the blessing that the gospel brings to us. And so as we think about Matthew 9, there are two points that we need to consider. The paralyzed man forgiven and life restored. So firstly, we see the paralyzed man forgiven in verses 1 to 8. Some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. The ministry of Jesus among them so far should have been enough for them to know that he was indeed that expected Messiah. And that these things were part of that. But the fact that Jesus' words caused such a stir among them means that Matthew 4 verse 16 is being worked out. As it says, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. The Messiah is among them. Jesus, the Messiah, is in their midst. They are witnessing both his power and his authority in the miracles that he performs and in the teaching that he gave. The paralyzed man knows the full reality of the darkness of this fallen world and the reality of his life. Sickness and suffering belong to that fallen world. In the word that Jesus speaks, a light dawns. A light is switched on for this man. But it's shocking because it's misunderstood by those who are standing around. They don't understand what he's saying and doing. He says, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. The men who had brought the man came in faith because they had heard of what he had done. The man lying on the mat believed in Jesus because of what he had done. And yet Jesus, looking at the man, recognizes a greater need and our greater need. That is to have our sins forgiven. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, has authority to forgive sin. But is that an authority recognized? That's the key question. It's all about both then and now having a proper understanding of who Jesus is. The scribes or the teachers of the law of verse 3 don't have that understanding. 
And so they call Jesus out. They say that his words are blasphemy. Yes, they may think of him as a teacher, perhaps. They may even think of him as someone who has performed some wonderful miracles. But what they don't get is actually who Jesus is. They should have known because they have access to the scriptures. But as they see what's happening, they don't see what it means. The Bible is clear. These are the things to expect when the Messiah comes. It was happening in front of them, but they can't see it. That is why Jesus describes what, it, they, are, what they are actually thinking as evil. Why? Because they are denying the truth of what God is doing. All that God had promised he would do when he sent his son as the Messiah. Therefore, Jesus counters their argument that he has no authority to forgive sins with a direct challenge, proving to all who were present that he did indeed have such an authority. He says, which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, get up, take your mat and go home. And the man got up and went home. He did the harder thing to prove the point that he had indeed authority to forgive sins. If he were the fraud that these men were claiming, the man would have remained on his bed. But instead he got up in front of everyone and went home. The scribe's concern was that he was saying something only God could say. But he healed the man and underlined the fact that he was indeed the Messiah, the Son of God, who could forgive sins, who would walk to the cross to deal with her sin. And there's the point that they're missing. He was God. The response is that everyone was in fear that day. And that's the right response, of course, to be in the presence of the Lord in that way. The question is, as we read this passage, as we think about what it means, have you recognised Jesus for yourself? Have you recognised his authority as the Son of God? The reverent fear that is due to him. And therefore the forgiveness Jesus has won for you. You see, the men who heard Jesus that day called him a blasphemer because they didn't recognise the scripture being fulfilled. They didn't recognize the promises of Jesus worked out in his life. And the point is that you and I need to look at scriptures and see the promises that will be fulfilled in Jesus for us when he comes again, when he returns. Do you recognize his authority over your life so that you're ready, so that you're prepared, so that you're ready to meet your savior and your master and your God. Well, secondly, we move on to verse 18 through to 26, where we see life restored. It says, while he was saying this, a ruler came and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. Here we see the plight of two women, transformed by the touch of Jesus. Firstly, a ruler approaches Jesus about his daughter. From Mark's gospel, we know that this is Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue. Matthew tells us that his daughter has just died, but in faith, Jairus believes that Jesus can still restore her life. The thinking of, of the time, of course, believed that in those first three days after death, there was the possibility of resuscitation, which is why later on in John's gospel, uh, when Lazarus has died, Jesus waited until the fourth day to come to Mary and Martha so that the uh, proof of the resurrection of Lazarus could not be doubted. But as anyone who knows a loved one who has died, we know that in that moment, 
there's very definite, definitely a finality to the fact that life has ended for the person. Never to return in this world. Realizing that helps us to understand the strength of Jairus' faith to believe that the touch of Jesus is all that will be required to revive his daughter. Like the centurion before in chapter 8, as a man of authority, he recognizes a man of authority. It is the divine authority of Jesus to restore life to the dead. However, before we can get to that, there's an interruption from a woman in the crowd. She believes that to touch Jesus, even to touch the edge of his clothes, will be enough to cure her from the bleeding that has plagued her life and dumbfounded the doctors. Jesus, even though the crowd are crowded around him, knows what has happened as she touches his, at the, ed, the hem of his, his garment. And what he does is he acknowledges the faith of the woman and responds in verse 22, Take heart, daughter. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. The English trans translations say that she was healed or that she was made well. Whereas the original Greek has a further meaning, which can also mean that she was saved. It says from that hour on, she was saved in the original. Yes, she was cured in the moment, but it was an ongoing thing. Through Jesus, she was saved from her suffering. The anguish of her life was turned around. Why? Because she met Jesus and she submitted to him. From this, Jesus continues to Jairus' house, where he is confronted by what can only be described as a commotion coming from those who are gathered, which included professional mourners and others. It was commonplace at the time to employ these professional wheelers, as they might have been referred to at the time, but Jesus dismisses them. He sends them away. Go away, he said. Why? Because they're not necessary. The girl is not dead, she is merely asleep. As professional mourners, they knew what death looked like. They know that the girl is dead. That's why they laugh at him. You're talking nonsense, basically. As Jesus enters the room, Jairus' faith in the authority of Jesus is proven. Remember he had said earlier, you can, re you can restore life to my daughter if you come and uh, uh, you can raise her to life. He knew the authority that Jesus had. And so his desire for his daughter to live again is realized since Jesus simply takes her hand and raises her to life. The one who had proven his authority to forgive sins is the same one who has authority over life and death. Simply because of who he is. The son of God who came to give each of us life when we were dead, to forgive us our sins by becoming sin for us and dying in our place as the one who was without sin, who was the Son of God and our Saviour. So I come back to our beginning. As you recognise the people around you in life who have authority, have you recognised the greater authority of the one who, have, who has authority over life itself, who has authority to heal you, authority to forgive you, authority to save you, and authority over life and death, who will be our judge. As we recognize his authority as the Messiah, the Son of God, like the people in Matthew 9, Jesus is willing and able to do that which you desire. He is the only one who can give you life in the kingdom. And we receive it in the same way seen in Matthew 9. Believing in Jesus. Believing in who he was and his authority. 
and coming before him in faith, trusting him. So come to him, remain in him. Why? Because as we see this morning, he is the one who will not let us die. He is faithful in his grace and in his mercy towards us to forgive us and to heal us of our infirmity. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Father, thank you for the life that we know because of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you have restored life to us as we repent in faith and trust in you. Help us, Lord, to live out that life before you and before others, that you may be honoured and glorified. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to sing our final hymn this morning, number 552 in the hymnal. I hear thy welcome voice. Let's stand. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.